Salutations, ladies and gentlemen, the Knife Raven here, back again with another video. And in today's video, well, you know what they always say, good things come to those who wait. And I would prefer to not make you wait, but in this particular case, I didn't really have much of a choice. Well, that's an exaggeration. I did have a choice, and I made my decision. You see, I did this video probably last Monday, and I was supposed to release it that same day. But I didn't. Why didn't I? Well, I was very unsatisfied with the quality of said video. I thought it was substandard um, by quite a large amount. It lacked, well, much of anything, and I figured it wasn't worth uploading, as I don't like delivering subpar content to you, and I most certainly do not want to disrespect a knife of this beauty. Now, here I am, I'd say this is my second try, it's more likely this is my eighth or ninth try at this rate, and, well, this knife is something that I have been hoping to review for a while, and I never really got a hold of one, because of the price, but, well, I found a very, very, very good deal for this knife at... Warriors and Wonders Blades Canada. In fact, I would almost say it's half off. And it's still a very expensive knife, not one that you'd get with pocket change or anything like that. But I suppose, without further ado, let's... <laughs> let's hope that this video does not go the way of all the others and that it actually reaches you instead of ending up in the trash bin like so many others before it. So, first and foremost, here is the box that this knife comes in. This is a Boker knife of their high-end line. This is the Boker Zollingen series, and these are among Boker's best quality offerings. The only things higher than this would be their customs with, say, the historic series, like the Tirpitz, the M4 Sherman, or the Messerschmitt 109. And again, these are very high-end, comparable to GEC in many, many ways, but again, Nice hard box, very, very large considering the knife's actual appearance. Within the box, you have a very nice little case, right, with a little bit of embossing here. Boker is all in. Within, this is where the knife comes packed. You have an extra spare compartment here and here. And here are your warranty cards with your information on the product in English und Deutsch. So there you go, that hopefully balances out the ridiculous cost of this knife. So, what is this knife? Well, it's the little brother to the Boker Sports Messer, which is a very fancified take on the, uh, say, a, a traditional multi-tool like a Victorinox, Swiss Army knife. However, they include much higher performing steels, more attachments in some cases, and much more expensive handles. And that's exactly what, what this is, except it's just in the form of a pocket knife. Very similar handle in the model's design. It has a single blade of a spear point, drop point variety. I'll get into that in a moment. And handles made of desert ironwood. Desert ironwood is among the hardest woods in the world, if not the hardest wood in the world. It's very difficult to obtain as it only grows in a very specific desert, I believe, in its bordering on both Mexico and Arizona. I believe it's called the Sonora Desert, although my American viewers will kill me if I get that wrong. But in the meantime, I only have one other knife in this material, that being the Taylor's Eyewitness Premier Collection Barlow. This is again a very high-end knife. It was a very um, with a very high price tag, but this is a very, very well put together knife. Excellent fit and finish, brilliant walk and talk, and just a beautiful style as a whole. Now, uh, I have reviewed this knife before, I believe, on my other channel, and the lighting was just as poor, so unfortunately I'm going to have to find a day when there's more natural light before bringing this knife out again. 
But this knife, which features again the same wood, except the grain is a bit more visible here, is very, very, very well done. And the fit and finish on these is top notch. So to start, this is a new pattern to me. It's known as an equal end cigar jack. And you can definitely see that in the closed position, this knife could invoke the image of an old style cigar. The materials here are very nice. You have <clears throat> nickel silver for the bolsters. And of course, these are milled which adds a nice little extra touch. The pins are also nickel silver. Simple pins, they're all of the same size, and I know that should go without saying, but there are knives that tend to have odd pin dimensions in the case of this GEC. You can see these two are quite a bit smaller than the central pin, so none of that on this knife. There is a shield with the embossed chestnut tree logo. I believe I've said it's an oak tree before. That is completely wrong. This is a chestnut tree. And I know a lot of people don't tend to like shields on their knives. One that I can specifically name is Eric from the channel Slick Slicers. He is a collector of Taylor's Eyewitness knives. And one of his many um, celebrations of these is that they don't put any shields on their knives. And... While I personally like a good shield, I can absolutely understand the love of a simplistic style, too. And I think that this shield does blend in very well with the handle, at least on a personal level. Pins are extremely flush, can't even feel them. Again, this is not something that's terribly common, but this knife absolutely aced it. Transitions from the bolsters to the covers are utterly immaculate. Blade centering is, actually, it's one of those blades where you can sort of push it back into place, but it's, well, it's centered now, but it was a little bit off just a moment before. One thing I very much appreciate is the fully sunken joint here. This is something that a lot of knives tend to ignore, and don't end up doing. I really, really like it when this happens, as... It means that taking this out of your pocket is a lot easier, and it's a lot less likely you'll catch it on anything. Um, one thing that I can say, and this is a point for Boker and a point away from GEC, Great Eastern Cutlery, despite all of their very promising traits, they almost never do this. As you can see, the joint is not sunken, but rather very much protruding. And depending on the style of the knife, this is another Boker. This one also does this. Um, here's an otter messer that actually does have a somewhat sunken joint, but not entirely. And I'll throw in one more comparison, I suppose. Ah, uh, two, actually. Here is a Groman knife. This is a local Canadian-made piece with the sunken joint. Very, very smooth. And here is another... German knife with a fully sunken joint. This one is the Friedrich Hartkopf Jack. And these two knives are actually very comparable. The price point, of course not, but in size they're similar, with this one being a little bit thinner and a little longer, and also having a bare head instead of a capped design. But they both feature spear point blades, have shields, and have very nice wooden handles. And they are equal end, so very symmetrical. But yeah, very comparable. So back to this knife. What else is good about it? Well, gapping, because I know gapping bothers, well, everyone in the knife community, as it probably rightfully should. There are no gaps on this whatsoever. In fact, holding it up to what little light there still is here, nothing can shine through. This is seamless through and through. The liners are also perfectly smooth. Nothing's raised, nothing is catching. Beautifully sanded to perfection. Another thing that this knife does that, well, 
I'd say a lot of high-end knives do, but in this case, actually, a lot of cheaper knives do, and the particular brand that I'm specifying here is Rough Rider. What they often do is use French nail nicks with the match strike pull. Match strike, of course, is all those little teeth um, underneath the initial dip of the nail nick. And, of course, the name, you can strike a match on it, but aside from that, they make for a very nice grip on the blade for pulling it open. But, very, very nice nail nick here. Some of it is a little bit hard to reach, but up here, it's very easy to just get a good grip on the knife and pull it open. Again, as I said, this is a cross between a drop point and a spear point. The spear part definitely is referenced by this top bit, as you can see that right at the front, let's see, get that to actually focus, perhaps. Nope. There we are. So, you can see that the front of the blade definitely has the profile of a traditional spear point. However, the only thing that makes me think that it might also be a bit of a drop point is there is an ever so slight dip, more in the pivot area, less than the actual blade shape. But the way that it's curved down, perhaps I'm wrong in saying this, but to me it looks a bit more like a hybrid rather than just a pure through and through spear point, because here I will give an example of a very obvious spear. There is no questioning that this is indeed a spear point. Again, the Friedrich Hartkopf. You can see that this, this knife is pretty much the traditional requiring image of a spear point. It has a fairly rounded top, curves down into a very slight point, definitely not the sharpest of all blade shapes in the tip, but again, you can see this one does seem to have a bit more of a bend to it, but I definitely would call this a spear point. If I had to pick, it's still a spear point because a drop point looks more like this. And this does not look like a drop point in that regard. So I'd still call this a spear point, although Questioning that it might be a hybrid is, well, I suppose that's still up in the air. But regardless, here's the blade. And it's a very beefy blade at that, has a bit of a belly here. Slight recurve at the base. And there is a little sharpening choil. Satin finished, which is actually quite uncommon on knives of this price, as my other premium boker that I can bring forth is a Barlow. Has a nice mirror polish. But mirror polishes showcase scratches a lot worse than satin finishes, and thus I tend to carry them a little less. Also, the same can be said with this Taylor's Eyewitness. Again, mirror polish. But it's certainly not as dark as the uh, Castleberg Stockman, which has an acid wash. This is another high-end boker. So, what is the steel on this? Well, I probably named it already in the title or description, but this is N690 Bowler steel, and Bowler N690 is a very nice mid-range steel. There will definitely be the steel snobs that say it's not M390, it's not S90V, it's not S45VN. No, it isn't. But, again, for a traditional pocket knife, and the majority of these often feature AUS 6, 440C, 420HC, um, 440A. Having an upgraded N690 blade is definitely a worthy choice. And I very much like seeing steels that aren't as common used in, in ways like this. And I have another N690 knife. It's made by Ottermesser, and that is the Finn model. And the Finn model has a drop point blade, and it's a very, very nice, harder use knife, while still maintaining a thin enough profile to be good for, say, food prep use, and just general tasks that a thinner blade would be more adapt at. And, again, this blade is still quite thin. It is a traditional knife, which means that the stock 
is not going to be nearly as thick as your average modern knife, but when compared with even other traditional knives, I'll bring forth an example again, the Hartkopf, you can see that they're quite similar. Maybe the Boker is a little bit thicker at the front. Speaking of measurements, this knife is UK legal. I will just show you that quickly. You're looking at an overall length of just around six and a half uh, inches. The blade length is probably, if you're including the unsharpened bit, that's around just, just a little over two and three quarters, but the cutting edge alone is two and a half. So very much UK legal. You're not going to have any issues with this, but yeah, it's a slip joint, so that should also help. The action is very, very good. I'd give this a solid seven out of 10. And despite there being no stop pin visible, this knife does not accumulate any blade wrap. And I have tested quite a few times. I have opened this and closed it. And there is no sign of blade wrap at all. So the way Boker assembles these, they are ensuring that your edge will not be damaged when simply closing the knife, which is an issue with a lot of traditional knives, particularly French ones. But... Yes, this is definitely a very well-designed knife, aside from a well-built knife. Should mention also that they have their chestnut tree logo here. It also says Boker Zollingen in 690. And at the front, there is a dual swedge on the blade. Another feature, or rather design feature, that I absolutely adore about this it's one of the most comfortable traditional knives I've ever had. You get a good four finger grip on it, and again, my hands are medium size. They are definitely not small, and they're not huge. So I get a good four finger grip on this already, but with the unsharpened bit of the blade, and again, that almost unusual curve down, you can get your finger right underneath it, and perhaps your thumb right up here, and you get an excellent saber grip on this. This is truly a very, very comfortable knife. I am more biased to my left hand, but I can, of course, still use knives in the right, but this is just unbelievably comfortable. And you have a lot of strength behind that edge, because now your finger's in the way, blocking it from closing, so you can really get a lot of use out of this. And again, you have that high performance N690, which means that cutting will be really, really simple and very, very easy. By the way, factory edge, I have not sharpened this at all, nor really used it. One of the sharpest knives I have ever bought right out of the box, which is what I'd be expecting for about $210, which is indeed the price that this was in Canadian. Uh, the shipping and tax, of course, brought it more to around $2, 225 230 and that is definitely not cheap. It's, it's still cheaper than the Taylor's Barlow. Uh, be more than a Michael May Custom, more than a Friedrich Hartkopf by a long shot, more than the Cats, more than this Boker, which was also bought on sale, more than a GEC at its normal price, but if you're buying secondary market, it's going to be pretty close, if not the GEC costing way, way more. Um, let's see. What else can I compare this to? I guess I'll compare it with that Michael May I just took out. This is a custom knife, and again, this is very much a handmade piece. There's no real machine work going into this. Whereas with the Boker, it's probably a bit more automated, although there is still hand assembly, hand sharpening, and everything. But you can see that while the Boker is perfectly symmetrical, the Michael May is not. Even by the back, you can see there are bits that kind of stick out, and you can feel them at the very top, for example, there. 
Meanwhile, the bokeh is just completely smooth throughout. Transition to spring, or from spring to blade, is simply perfect. Blade play does not exist on this. And I already said gapping is not an issue. Centering is pretty much perfect. Liners are perfectly sanded. Everything is smooth. Everything is just fluid and perfect here. The shield doesn't even stick up, and these are pinned, so I don't know if that's the case on all bokers, but it's not like it's going to fall out. Again, the nail nick's wonderful. Half stops are authoritative. Very nice snap. Very nice action. Great steel. Lovely wood handle here. And amazing use and potential. And again, it lives up to its name. This is a top-class gentleman's knife. And really, that's the majority of the knives I have. The style I like is very traditional, very simple, but still very classy at the same time. And a lot of these knives would fit into that particular category, if you will, of small, um, non-threatening, but still usable knives. And... Well, this definitely is, it is probably going to destroy a lot of the competition, as, again, the fit and finish is definitely on the level of GEC, but this would be a lot easier to get than a GEC. And comparing it to a lot of other knives, I mean, price is a good factor, but for quality, it's leaps and bounds better than this, considerably better than that. Um... Probably close to this, but that's a whole other story. Similar to this, but I actually have to say this one still holds its own, as it's probably about a quarter of the price of this on sale, and at its normal price, it's probably more like an eighth. So definitely in its own league there. Uh, better than the Cats, and compared to the other Boker as well. Same company, so similar fit and finish, but... These are very similar, again, in the build quality. I compare it to this, probably the closest for any other brand, if you're comparing it to. It would definitely be more akin to a Taylor's Premier. It doesn't have the file work, which would be a nice extra embellishment, but it's still very good in its own way. It's better than Ottermesser, that I will confirm. Better than Groman and probably close to GEC. Again, I'm not going to say it's better than GEC, but I'm also not going to say that it's worse. So I think it's safe to say this is definitely on par with GEC, although much easier to find. So that almost concludes the video, and I know this has been a lot longer than I was hoping that it would be, but I have one last thing to mention, and it's also a question I offer. The only flaw, the one flaw I can find with this knife, oh, I also nearly forgot to mention, the spring is flush even in the half-stop position, which is just, that's unheard of most of the time with knives. So the one thing that I have to say, and this is perhaps a flaw, the blade, yeah, you can see that, can't you? That blade is off, by, again, quite a little bit. Quite a little bit. Those are a little contradicting, aren't they? Huh. But you can see that there is a bit of a bend to the right. Now, looking at where the actual blade starts, the extended tang, and following it up, the blade itself is perfectly straight. There are no warps here. I would like to say that. There is not a warp to be seen on this knife. And with the majority of knives that I have probably said have warps, they probably don't either. Heck, look at this Taylor's Eyewitness knife. You can see here where the tang is and then where the blade goes. There isn't a warp here. However, it seems that where it was mounted at the pivot, it's biased to go to the right. And you can see that. Now, these are both handmade in varying degrees. And again, here's another very handmade knife. This is a Michael May. This one's off to the left. And again, the blade itself 
doesn't appear to have any warps in it. It's just at the pivot, the blade seems to have moved off to the left. And I don't really know why that is. I doubt that they're stamping them out bent, and I doubt they're deliberately bending them for whatever reason. Which makes me wonder, is it possible that this is some kind of unavoidable thing? Because I'm looking through a lot of the knives I have, and I've noticed this happens a lot. Warps are rare. Edges that are bent, that's an uncommon thing to see. But edges that look bent, because at the pivot, they seem to be off in their assembly, is a very, very common thing. In fact, I can't name a single brand that I've bought, unless, of course, I've bought one knife from the brand and got really, really lucky. The majority of knives from the majority of brands all have some degree of offset blades. Some are worse than others. There is that horror show of a tailor's basic lamb foot um, that I rarely like speaking of. But a lot of them, even if it's just minimal, like that Otter Weaver's knife, Warps are rare, and I don't have many. I could probably count them on both hands. But the amount of knives that have offset blades, even though the blades are straight, that I could not count on two hands, because there are so many of them. And really, I know this is turning into a ramble, and I don't want that to happen again. That makes me ask, is this some kind of unavoidable thing that might just happen when you're hand making knives, because I can't be too picky. The centering is still very, very close to spot on. And it seems that the swedge is actually a little off here. That is one thing that I did notice. But the blade itself is still very, very nice. This is a very clean cutter. Hello, Alice. But I just don't know what to say in regards to the blade being mounted incorrectly. I'm no knife maker, and I don't claim to be. And I can't really say, is this just what happens sometimes when you're putting together a knife? Does the blade lean off to one side? Is that avoidable? Is it unavoidable? Am I thinking that it's a flaw when it's not? Uh, I don't know. I've seen a lot of people review knives and not discuss offset blades. And then I've seen, while watching their videos, that the blades seem offset. And it doesn't seem to bother them. As long as the centering is perfect when closed, they don't even seem to notice it. So, again, am I just creating an issue where one doesn't exist and offset blades have been a thing forever and never were complained about until I came along and started making a big deal about them? I don't know. Maybe. But either way, this is definitely, this is definitely a very well-put-together knife in every other aspect and one flaw to get in a handmade knife of such perfection in every other field, I'm still going to give this a solid 9 out of 10. Price is a little high, I will say that, and if I, I would not have bought this had it been the normal price. I never thought I'd be able to. It cost around 400 Canadian dollars to get this normally, and I, I never thought I'd get it, but I managed to get a very, very nice sale on it and snag it for about half that. So, for that price, I'd say it's worth it. For 400 I don't know if I would be so enthusiastic. But regardless, this is a very, very well put together knife, and even if it bugs me on a personal level, this is still one of the nicest carry knives I've had for the few days since I got it. And I got it on Monday, so it's been, what, about three days? And I got it early Monday, so you could almost say four. But... It's just, it's a very, it's a very well put together knife. It's a very nice knife to carry. And for those couple days I've had it, it's been simply wonderful. It's a majestic knife. It's a beautiful knife, but it's still rugged in its own way. And I think that it's a great example of just the quality that Boker can put into their knives. And I, I really like this knife, and if, if this is just something that happens when you hand make a knife and it's not really avoidable, you know, slight shake of the hand can cause this, then I'm not complaining. And if this is something that all knives have and I've just never noticed, well, that's my issue then. But this is just a wonderful knife. I absolutely love it, 
And as much as I appreciate the other bokers I have, for example, this one, I like the style of a Barlow, I like the history of this one, I, I would have to say that this is my favorite boker. And it'll probably take a long, long while before that changes. So thank you very much for watching. I've, I've enjoyed making this video, and I hope that you, if you sat through this very long video, I hope you enjoyed my rambles, and I hope that I've helped you make your mind up if you were going to buy this knife. So thank you very much for watching. This has been The Knife Raven. As always, signing off. Goodbye.